This is another uh, wonderful tour of the museum. There's loads in it, linking to sustainability. So I'm really, really pleased everybody could join us today. Thank you for coming along. You're going to be split into two groups, as you know. So. Um, <laughs> oh, oh my god, god. Yeah, that was not. Not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's here, and this group here, and this group here, and this group here, you go with that group. Um, and that's wonderful. Right, I'll fabulous. Right, fabulous. Well, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? You want to oh, yes, so yeah. my name's um, Anna Bunny. I am the engagement manager in the museum, um, and I work with the learning engagement team and um, I'm going to take you to the top floor which is our new environmental and social justice hub. Right, uh, I'm Hannah Chalk, I am the curator of learning, um, I'm also part of the learning engagement team. I'm going to take the first half of you up to some of our new galleries to start with. Uh, just to say throughout the next couple of hours you're going to see loads of stuff, we'll give you a brief introduction to some of these spaces but please Spend time having a look around and please, please, please ask us questions. We'll be only too happy to answer them. And if we can't, we'll make sure that the people who can are able to get back to you to give you the answers. And um, so enjoy looking around. There's, I'd also say what you're going to get today is literally a tiny snapshot of what there is in this place. I've worked here many years as has Anna. We've seen some of it probably, the time it takes to look at it properly. You want to chip away at it over time. So don't see this as the only chance to come to the museum. Do come back in your own time. Because it's free. Yeah. Excellent. Right, do you want to I'll start go first, off? You've so got we're further going to, to go. We've got furthest to go. You're and right. then I will take you, when I've finished, I'm going to deliver you to your next um, speaker. Speaker? Speaker, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> so this way. Oh, oh, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, so if you guys you wait everyone, a sec, okay. Anna's just going to go first. Okay, and this is what happened last year. Is the end of the gallery. So, and this space and the next two places we're going to go are very new and very different to the museum. What you will find in this museum is that it's very old. We're part of the University of Manchester, and we've got lots of stuff from the a lot of the research, but also collections from across the world. The way things have normally been done in this museum and the way that collections are kept and the way that jobs are allocated is all about what subject you work in. So when you go through there, you'll find archaeology and above there, there's more archaeology and Egypt. And then you cross into the next side of the building and you will find all the nature, all of the natural history and the fossils. So the buildings kind of split in two where you've got nature on that side, and culture on this side. And as far as sustainability is concerned, that's not useful because I think sustainability is about how those two are very connected. And actually by drawing that line between the people and everything else, you're effectively continuing to cut off the natural world and reinforce that sort of thinking that may just see the natural world as a resource for us to use and not worry about. And it feels like more recently, and this museums are very slow to change. So what you're going to see is groundbreaking in a museum world and probably not that groundbreaking in human type, but we have changed things in the new galleries that we've developed because we've been trying to understand and present the world a bit more like it is, which is mixed up and not nature and culture and through doing that we're trying to reinforce the idea and show people how we are part of the natural world and by thinking of ourselves as part of the natural world we stand a better chance of living within our means and looking after things and not just extracting and extracting and harming without realizing what the impacts are so the bigger underlying message of the next three spaces we'll look at is kind of about we are all connected, basically. Um, and that is explored in this gallery called the Belonging Gallery, where you will find natural history, you will find archaeology, you will find more natural history, you'll find modern artefacts, you will find lots of things mixed up together because this is a really good introduction to how we're trying to retell some of those stories 
Also, the story is being told from the people who they're about rather than the curators who look after the stuff. So we're trying to avoid having one message that comes from an expert and trying to talk to the people whose lived experiences we're actually trying to engage people with. So this is a really good example. You will see that all of the interpretation is done through comic artists. And this is a very different way of presenting information. There are still some labels, but instead of just going, this is this, this is this, there's a really beautiful story attached to these objects, okay? And I will give you some time to have a look around this gallery when I've just talked you through the next two, and then you'll have a chance to look around, because there's lots to see. Right, so this is the belonging gallery. Through the next room is our new Chinese culture gallery. And <clears throat> this was also very recently made. And uh, what you'll see in this gallery again is mixtures of those different types of collections. So you're not just looking at Chinese historical artefacts. We're trying to reconnect some of those stories as they happen in real life about how the natural world and culture and tradition and heritage and different practices are totally connected. And that drawing that line down the middle feels even less common sense when you start to put these things back together. So this one I love because it's just beautiful. But this just it just shows some of the ways that, say, the, the natural world inspires decorative art, but also the raw materials from the natural world also really importantly shape the industries, the crafts, um, and the different ways that the countries evolve and the different trade and then what happens out of that. And it just feels a lot more kind of honest about reconnecting the world as kind of a messy mixed up world where you've got people, you've got the natural world and the two interconnecting is what happens when people live, you know, and what, how history is made. So this, I'm doing a whistle stop, we'll walk around. So this uh, Chinese culture gallery is another one that tries to break those divides down. Okay. So um, this is the third of the new galleries that, again, is like the Chinese Culture Gallery. This South Asia gallery is named after the sort of geographical location. But instantly you will see this is not simply about talking about cultural heritage without acknowledging the natural world is vital in that. And the important thing about the South Asia gallery is that this has been a labor of love. It has taken many years to create. And it is the product of many years' work with about 31 local members of the South Asian diaspora community who have been working with the museum and the British Museum and designers to select what stories and what objects should be in this gallery. So this is not like the beginning to the end of South Asia history. What this is, is the important stories that the people who have, whose culture this is, wanted to share about their own culture. So there are collections from the British Museum and our museum. There's also material that people have donated or lent us from their own personal collections, and their own sort of possessions. And these stories are told by the people who they're about. This is not about us going, we will tell you about someone else's story. Everything has been co-produced, which is very challenging, very time consuming, but extremely rewarding in terms of what you get out of it. And again, I think that's helped to avoid that division between the natural world and human cultures, because I think most of us don't see the world like that when we're living in it. So you will find examples here through this South Asia gallery, things like kind of just raising awareness of the really sustainable practices that people have always carried out, you know, using plant leaves for plates or, you know, uh, re, um, not reusable, kind of decomposable clay cups that you throw on the ground, you smash and you return it to the earth. It's, it's about really sort of sustainable traditions that have become, in many cases, overtaken by Western ways of doing things that aren't sustainable. And actually looking back at how those really sensible practices 
can really improve the way things are done again and, and reconnecting with those traditions and practices is a really important way of understanding better ways of living in balance with the world. So these three galleries are all about culture, but not without the nature as part of it. Um, and they're very much about how we hope in the longer term to move forward in terms of how we talk about the world. As I say, it will take many years for other things to change in this place, but this is kind of the ideal model moving forwards, I think. Well, I've got so bad time management. I'm like, there's never enough time in this place. You are going to have to come back. <laughs> Just a slow walk round. Um, well, well, what fantastic opening of the door you're doing. Oh, so, no, yeah. don't. It's, it's so exciting, this place. And it's, it's great to be able to get you excited about talking about it. It's, it's been a big change reopening, so... Uh, really this is good. This is yeah. good. Sorry, I'm going to tear people away from me. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hello, uh, sir. Okay, sorry. We've got one more little stop on our um, tour before I take you to see the frogs, which is you will not be able to tear yourself away from the frogs. No. Don't worry. Um, so if you want to follow me, we're just going up some stairs um, to the next gallery. Um, slightly different space. Uh, this, um, this is a small temporary exhibition, which is called Carbon Ruins. And I brought you up here because I was involved in this, so I've got a lot to say about it, but I will rein it in. And um, Carbon Ruins, you will see there is some crazy stuff on display here. There's a pair of cargo pants. There's a nappy. There's toys. There's a Barbie bath. There's a jar of honey. There are things that you might go, why is that in a museum? Okay. And... That is exactly the question, because this exhibition is um, the work of 12 different primary and secondary school groups who were asked to imagine that they are living in the year 2050 and to imagine we're not going to question the fact that we have reached net zero emissions by 2050 and we are living in 2050 and they are the curators of the Carbon Ruins exhibition that is all about telling people how we changed and learn to live more sustainably. So talking about the sort of things that would be in an exhibition in 2050 from the 2020s that, that would be rare, valuable museum pieces because we don't use them anymore. So we've got things like cargo pants in there because there were two secondary school students who thought what they represent is sweatshops and the fast fashion industry. So they've written an amazing story on the label that tells you all about how Sweat, sweatshops and fast fashion slowly declined over the years to 2050 and how we learned to use clothes and make clothes much more sustainably. We've got someone who talks about nuclear bombs no longer being around in 2050 because we've learned that peace is not only better for society, but actually there's so much less emissions because uh, defence generates an awful lot of emissions and also all of that money that goes on war is suddenly, by 2050, being put into improving the environment. So these are the stories written by primary and secondary students about their visions of a hopeful future, written from 2050 and looking back on how things change. So you will find some slightly bonkers ideas. You will find some really, some of them really kind of oh, touch the heart. There's some, and there's some really crazy tech ideas. <laughs> Um, there's all sorts of things, but for me, this is a really amazing way we found of working with young people to give them a bit of hope about the future because we're skipping the problems. And when you start from the future and look back, there's something really hopeful about that. And there's something also that opens up the imagination and gives you that sort of ticket to be creative and imaginative that is difficult when you're looking forward from today and you're going, well, that's never going to happen. They're never going to do that, or that's too big. But when you imagine that you're already in that future, that's when these amazing ideas come to, come to light. And actually what we found really heartening is that these students haven't sort of talked about like plastic straws or things that are about individual responsibility. They've talked about social change. They've talked about how politics and big business have had to change. 
and how that change has happened, usually through protest or um, voting with your wallet, you know, and not buying things. Um, and it's a really, it's a really heartening experience if you get the chance to read any of them, just to have a look at what these young minds are capable of. So I'll give you a few minutes to have a look around. And um, my favourite is the plastic toys because when I walk in, I'm like, oh, they're all shiny. <laughs> And focusing on in terms of you know um, carbon emissions, definitely, and, and well, vapes also. I mean, there's a constellation of different issues around vapes. Isn't there? Totally, and it just it was we were really impressed with how much of an overlap they were able to make between human and planetary health. Yeah, and that what well, it's bad for one, it's going to be bad yeah. for the other. Yeah very obviously in both cases. That's the point that Alex makes, you know, the, the relationship between emissions and um, uh, health. Yeah, you know, absolutely, mm. absolutely. Mm. Stuff in the museum, we have living things as well. Um, and we're going to go to see the vivarium where we have live frogs and amphibians and reptiles and no more plastic toys or Barbie dolls. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Lovely. Yeah. Right. All, right. Yeah, so All right. Hi, guys. So I'm Bethany. Um, so I'm one of the curatorial assistants here at the um, Manchester Museum Vivarium. Um, so my job is essentially to manage um, the collection here. Um, so this collection essentially started off um, sort of over 50 years ago as a um, museum aquarium. It was a collection that worked with the zoology department at the university, so the animals were used for observations, like behavioural purposes, um, and for research for the university. Now, over the re most recent sort of 30 years, um, this vivarium has sort of adapted into what it is today. So it's specifically um, sort of tailored to amphibian care, and what our prime purpose is, is to um, create... Um, genetically diverse populations of a critically endangered um, amphibian species, generally from uh, Central and South America. That's what we specialise in. Um, but essentially, yes, it's to bolster, um, create a bolster group um, of frogs of each species that we have here so that at some point down the line, if habitat recovers in some of these countries and some of these areas that these frogs are from, way down the line, we would be able to use uh, offspring from these um, populations to reintroduce into the wild. Um, so they really are a really vital safety net uh, for wild populations. So in this vivarium here, it's one of our most focal species for our um, sort of sustainability um, education. Um, this is the Atelopus varius, also known as the Harlequin frog. Um, so it's an absolutely gorgeous frog. So let me see if I can actually find a couple for you. So we do have all males in this vivarium. Um, I can't actually find them. Um, so they should be hopping around just on the rocks at the moment or on the um, rock work. If you can't see one in here for you, I'll take you just around the corner and we'll have a look in the vivarium there. Um, but they're a tiny little frog, um, black in coloration, with yellow underbellies and yellow and red uh, pattern on the backs. They are a critically endangered species from um, Panama and Costa Rica, and they have in recent history been considered extinct. Um, there was vast uh, swathes of time, sort of 10, 20 years, where not a single frog was found in the wild um, of this species. Now, um, in the past 10 years, tiny, tiny little populations that are really, really spread apart have been identified. Only one in Panama, one population in Panama, and only a few in Costa Rica. So... Um, they really are few and far between. And the habitat that they're found in is really suffering at the moment. Um, there is deforestation all around them, so the populations are fragmented, um, and the populations that they have are just tiny. So they really are under threat in the wild, and that's how they ended up coming to us at the vivarium. So we partnered with a charity called the Panama Wildlife Conservation Charity, and they work closely with this species of frog in the wild, so in, in situ, but also they have their own captive population as well. Um, so we can share genetics one day. Um, but for the meantime, this is what we're working with. So we collaborate with them, um, still have a lot of contact with them. They share information on environmental parameters with us so they can get measurements right from the wild, right from where some of these populations are. 
send us information and we use um, automated humidifiers and automated um, air conditioning. Um, so we've got a little example here where the current humidity is at and the moment that that humidity drops down, the humidifier sets in and rebalances all of that for them. So the parameters in there are as close to what you would find in the wild as we can possibly get them. And we've designed it all so that it's pretty much as close again as to the habitat they would find. We've got this stream um, uh, sort of feature. This frog do like to spend a lot of time by the streams. A lot of the males like to hang out by the water. Um, one of their main communication methods is waving at each other. Streams are quite noisy and where frogs usually shout at each other, um, they can't really do that. They can't be heard. So they start waving instead and that's how they attract females. And it's really lovely to see. Uh, we might get to. We'll see if we can spot somewhere on the other side in a moment. Um, so we quite try and communicate this partnership and um, a lot of the work that we do and the way that we are trying to sustain the population through the interp that we have around um, the vivarium, but we also have a lot of um, education sort of outreach programs. Uh, we have daily talks, all ways to try and educate on what this project is, what three other of our projects are, how important they are, and what people can do about it as well. Some of what, um, sort of, these are all sort of Central South American species. It's quite easy to become quite disconnected from such an exotic species, and you can't see this environment in the wild yourself. But trying to bridge that gap between these species um, and people in the UK um, and in Manchester um, is, is really sort of an exciting task. Um, does anybody have any questions? Would you like some time just to have a look around the vivarium, have a good read through, um, and I'll hover around here um, and if you've got any questions. I, I know there's quite a few small insects that look like ants. Are those? Yes, so those yeah, are those... fruit flies. So we put right. them in there. Um, that is our sort of frog food, essentially. Right. So they absolutely love the fruit flies. Yeah. We have as um, you can see, a lot of the animals um, up here, they're quite busy. They're all sort of up in the top area yeah. wow. um, <laughs> and would naturally be found alongside the frogs in the wild, but they just add that little bit of um, excitement up top. Yeah. Um, and it is great that these we can get something going on all the time. It Again, that sort of live aspect of the yeah. museum really does help connect people to the subject rather than, than only seeing sort of taxidermied. Right, so um, it's, um, simulating the natural yes. ecology with the animals yes. and the yeah, mm. just to try and immerse people in into this um, habitat mm. as much as we possibly can in such an artificial setting in the middle of Manchester <laughs> is it? Yeah, it's a great, interesting yeah. task to be. Has anybody a seen a harlequin frog? Has anybody seen a harlequin yeah. frog? They are in hiding at the moment. Yeah, and you can spot one. I'll see if I can spot one just around the corner as well. And I'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Curious. Uh, so these, these are Amazonian yes. habitats. Do you draw any parallels with yeah. the rainforests? Yeah. So we we don't sort of we are very specific in terms of Central and South America. However, the <laughs> decline in uh, British rainforests can be mirrored by the decline in Central and South American rainforests. And it is a really interesting thing because I think a lot of people aren't aware that UK would have what you consider rainforests. Um, I, was, I was really surprised when I found it. Yes, yes. Me too, to be honest. And this is something that it's only come to my knowledge in the last few years that that is technically what you would consider rainforest and that what we have left of them is very minimal, at least in a natural state anyway. So you can definitely draw that. And um, it's probably something that we would work better in, in doing is marrying up this example and our own UK species. There's probably that link missing within the interpretation and it's something that we would definitely like to, to improve on really. I think there is that disconnect. You know, you've got these animals that no one, no one in Manchester is going to be able to see this in the wild. So it is very difficult. It is very easy to remove yourself from that. You know, it's not your problem. So being able to create that link better. It would really help. Um, this, we've seen a species of animal in Florida, not the same. Yes, yes. Animals are not, prolific. Few, quite a few. Yes, all the way up to um, sort of 
in North America. Um, yeah. I think borrowed is about as high as they get. Yeah. Um, it would probably it be in southern. Yeah. Probably be in southern Florida. Well. Yeah, and they go right down the other side, down yeah. to South America but as well. These just in cent- mostly central. Mostly central, uh, but there's a vast array of animals, yeah. um, and it's they're fabulous. There's so many different types. Do they have this? Yes, they do, and this one they want to do. Yes, yeah, yeah. And they're fantastic. So they are brilliant. What's the nearest relative to the animals? So it would, would be other sort of lizard species, yeah. um, sort of iguanas. No, c- chameleon. Chameleon is close. It's a different continent, but again. But a lot of similarities there, yes. uh, but we also have a lot of anoles that are found we've, we've, on we've Caribbean seen islands. The chameleons in southern Spain, which is a northern right. part of it. That's yeah. brilliant. I've never, yeah, I've well, never seen them. Um, you know, found in the forest. Yes, yeah. I've never seen chameleons in Europe, which yeah. is well, but definitely. Yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> Uh, I think they thought it was something special. Oh, yeah, it yeah. Oh well, it will have been that's absolutely. Yeah. Like I think any kind of interesting wildlife in your way is um, sort of bonus to see, isn't it? And there was a forest where they were supposed to be. They were, it was on the edge of a reservoir. There was some, there was some bushes, oh. and and they were just on these bushes. But then there was a walk we did yeah. where it said, you know. Look out for the chameleons. But they were obviously trying to look after Yes, yeah. And we saw one of the little black men in the Seychelles. And the, and the bus driver was terrified of it. Yeah. It was about that big. You, know. you do find <laughs> this. It's a shame as well. You just you want to look after everything. But um, yeah, we find that in a lot of these places. That yeah. Generally met with a bit of, of, of fear, um, which is yeah, it's a shame. Oh, well, thank you. Thank it's you. not a problem. This, this place has changed now. Yes. So yeah. I was a student in my yes six years ago. And it, it's so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and very little in the way of links to actual UK wildlife. Right. So we wanted to be able to get involved with something, um, and amphibians were never going to be. An option. Uh, we don't have the space um, and all the facilities for that. But we did have that for an invertebrate. So I essentially kind of came upon um, a man in Devon who was working on a glowworm release project or reintroduction project, um, and quickly got involved with that. So we now have a population of glowworms um, in the in the back. And we've been raising those. Um, I'll bring them out actually, and, and I'll let you have a look because um, they're they're really cool to see. Um, but essentially, we've been breeding those um, over the last year. Uh, so we got them um, about eighteen months ago. Was um, breeding those, and then in August we were able to release uh, five hundred baby glowworms back into the site down in Devon. Oh, um, so it's a really cool project and one that we're actually able to re- reintroduce now. Um, everything else we have here is such a long way down the road. Um, but in, in this case, we've been able to find habitat that is suitable um, and, and try a re-release. So we'll know um, more about the success of that in a year or two uh, when we can start doing surveys and see how many are still in the area um, but that'll be really exciting so they kept in these tiny little tubs so they're really easy to manage um, so Aww. this was part of the selling point for us is that it's something we could do with sort of little space um, but essentially we've got the little holes in the in the lid so they can still breathe we've got a bit of ventilation um, these biodegradable cloths that we just keep moist and then we have our glowworms oh, here wow. so you can see he's glowing oh yes just a tiny little glow Oh, look. And that one at the end there as well. So they're really cool, aren't they? They're really cool and they do look, yeah. Yeah, so they're called glowworms and obviously they don't look like worms. They are actually beetles. Um, But they do, these are the larvae. Um, I was going to say the larvae stage. Yes, yes, larvae stage, uh, which they stay in for about one to two years, depending on the conditions. If If it's really good, they can reach adulthood from a baby in just a year but generally um two years and these are in the sort of final stages of larval um development Mm -hmm. and at the moment i've cooled them down um in the uk it is cooling down we try and replicate that so at the moment they're kept at about 14 degrees it's a little bit warmer than outside but 
14 degrees um, in our climate chamber. And then in, well, that'll keep decreasing until roughly March. I'll warm them up and then these guys will start to pupate into their adult form. Um, and that is when we'll be able to tell who's male and female. So the males look like this, very beetle looking, uh, wings and the hard sort of helmet. Mm -hmm. uh, and the females look exactly the same as the larvae. So oh, wow. uh, they're slightly chunkier, a little bit paler, but pretty much the same. So here's the um, adult female just there next to the, uh, so one to the middle. So a little bit different shape, but pretty much marble. Um, and then they breed. Um, so I, pa I pair them up um, into male and female tubs. They breed, lay about 300 eggs, and then shortly after, both male and female die. Um, so they literally have a two-year lifespan. Uh, but from those, uh, on the last summer, uh, we did have about 600 successful um, larvae hatch, which is amazing. And they're absolutely tiny. They're sort of just little full stops on the end of your finger. Um, and of, of those 600, 450 went out back into the release site in Devon. At the moment, we are focusing this in Devon. These adult glowworms were initially removed from Devon so we can breed them. So we want to put them back. We don't know what the difference in um, sort of climates would have yeah. on a population. So for now, we're, going, we're releasing down south, but there is scope for us to look at northern populations in the future, which is really exciting. And hopefully create a new network of glowworm populations across the UK, which is really cool. That was my question. I just wondered yes. about the habitat. The yes. So the habitat itself, um, it's kind of limestoney, long grasses, um, but pretty much anywhere that they can sort of um, have access to dense material that they can hide in, but then open, sparse land that they can glow in to attract mates. That is what they need. So it is quite varied in where they're found. The prime issue for glowworms is light pollution. And that only matters from about May to July when they start to breed, yes. So while they're glowing, if they can't see each other, no breeding happens, the population wipes out in two years. Um, and that's what we're finding. So we're kind of trying to translocate, essentially, um, populations into more suitable dark areas. Um, and doing that and then educating on that on top might be able to create knock-on effects to, you know, when people light things up and, and, and things like that. It could be really exciting for the future. So, yes. It is really <laughs> exciting. I'm so pleased to hear about that. I didn't realise that yes. you had this project going on. Yes, it's great. It, and it's yeah. lovely for us just yeah. to be able to do something to give back to the local yeah. environment as well. It's, it's yeah. definitely a missing connection we've had for a long time. Yeah. Right, so um, I shall take you up to the next um, Thank you. to the next person. And to we'll Anna. gather the troops. Brilliant, that'll be great. Uh -huh. I'll be there. Wait, just I'll just hover here. I'll hover here, but we're going over in that direction. Okay, so right, so okay. Yeah. Uh, my name's Anna Bunny, and as you can tell, I'm very technically competent. That's <laughs> not. <laughs> but um, I'm going to talk briefly about the top floor in the museum. Um, I'm sure um, colleagues have mentioned that our mission in the museum is to uh, build understandable clean cultures and develop a sustainable world. Um, and we do this in a number of different ways, both which are visible on the galleries, um, but also behind the scenes as well. So my first slide just talks a little bit about um, the fact that we um, we have um, um, a commitment to sort of like greening our buildings. Um, so we've monitored energy levels. We've also changed the light bulbs so that they're all LED. Um, we also have an environmental action group as well. So basically, um, yeah, we have a sort of we have sort of staff and volunteers who are able to join this environmental action group. We also have um, a colleague of mine called Hannah, whose slides these are, who is actually our environmental action manager. So somebody whose role it is to um, to look at environment within the museum. We also have Chloe, who's our social justice manager as well. So two members of staff whose responsibility is not just their responsibility, but lots of other people to help us think about those um, key issues. So in terms of building a more sustainable world, we, we do this through our exhibitions, but also through events and programming, learning programming, working with um, people of all ages, um, things. We also have this top floor co-working hub space as well which is a very different way of working. But it's what we look 
looking at doing is to write, try and build quite long-term relationships with different organisations and the people of Manchester um, and to develop things as we go along. Sounds a bit vague. So this was quickly my slide that was just talking about that, you know, behind the scenes to try and make things more environmentally sustainable. And other things we've been involved in is we also join in with sector-wide issues as well. So there's been a survey recently undertaken about asking people who visit museums and theatres about what environmental action they're taking, but also what they think museums and art galleries and theatres should be doing, which is very interesting. There's also things like finance. <laughs> how environmentally or socially just is our finance. So to come to the top floor, um, this is um, I, Manchester Museum is part of the University of Manchester, but we're also part of the City of Manchester as well. And it's very important to us for our civic function to be what we should be for the City of Manchester, but also talk to people and have conversations about what our role should be. So this top floor has developed into an experimental space where we can build some of those relationships with different organisations and people and work in quite a different way. So it um, and also provides sort of networking. So different communities are invited to use this space in a different way. So it might be, for example, that we have um, a college. So we have a college called Pink College, who are an educational college working with young neurodiverse adults, and they base themselves in the museum and other heritage settings. So for us, this is a partner because they are challenging the mainstream of how education is run today. So we have another partner called Olympia's Music Foundation that give free music lessons to children alongside. So again, a challenging because basically there isn't funding there for equity for young people to have that opportunity. But we work in partnership with them and programming as well. They and we're hosting their Christmas concert uh, at Christmas. Um, but we've also hosted the Kindle which are another a new supplementary school that are providing educational opportunities designed by young people in your side for what they need. Um, examples of um, uh, sort of environmental charities that we work with are a whole different range of all organisations as well. So, for example, we work with um, Clean Cities, who are campaigning, European campaigning group, who are campaigning, not Clean Cities, Clean Air. So they use us as a um, co-working space, but also they might run events if they were going to do an event, asking local people's opinion about Clean Air. So it's a very different way of working. It's, um, and as you can tell, it's quite a different way of a museum gallery to be. And that is one of our challenges, because we are normally closed to the public, between two and four, we do open. And you can see people wandering around. There are displays to see, uh, because in these cases here, we have displays about the work that the learning and engagement team do, but also work that our partners do. But we're also, and we have an artist in studio, an artist studio space that's currently in transition, but we did work with an artist who was looking at hands and dexterity. Um, and we will be did looking, uh, working with two artists um, who are going to input into our exhibition about wild, looking at people who are neurodiverse and people who are deaf experience of nature in quite a different way. But you might notice if you have, when you look around, we, we're trying to sort of um, make the welcome spaces speak to what this space is about but actually probably the best way is to talk to someone so we're still thinking about how those messages come over uh, and also on the 24th of february we're going to try out something called meet the change makers where people can come and meet the different groups and organizations involved so um 
one of the one of the things that's underpinning the development of the top floor is also for the museum staff to be out working. Um, and so we have a learning engagement team, have a rotor that we're here every day. And in fact, my amazing colleagues are sat over there testing out primary learning <laughs> at the moment. Um, and also the, we do have other members of the museum staff up here as well. And, um, so, and also because we're thinking about how we develop all our programmes and exhibitions to be co-developed with partners and co-developed other people. So um, we have a number of different spaces that are up in this area. So it's one of the co-working desks that you can see, the college space over there. We have some, we have a therapy room which is available for different therapists. Um, both we have an art therapist who's on placement in the museum, we've worked with occupational therapists, we're working with Manchester Rape and Crisis who is setting up um, therapy for, for women of a South Asian heritage um, and then we also have sort of two flexible learning spaces as well that we use for our engagement with the family program but also we, we are able to uh, partners and other people can hire these spaces it does tend to be that they hire we're not running this on a commercial basis we have other spaces in the museum which are now run by the university comforting department so they yeah so that so those are great so yesterday for example we hired it out to a group called in place of war and they are uh, they started off as a university project in, in, in theatre uh, and it's about peace building in uh, about peace building in theatre. So that's the type of group that we're happy to. This sounds really cool. We give reduced rates to. Uh, whereas if Susan wanted to come and run a conference, she would have to go through the university conferencing. Oh. Sorry. Because I'd love to run a conference. It would be lovely. So that's that's the greenhouse space. Um, which is there, which is the wonderful Rachel looks after. Um, and um, so that's that's part of, you might notice that we have plants all around the museum, which um, is great, except some of the spaces we have them, there isn't enough light for them to survive, but yeah. So I will show you, um, here is an example of some of the, the wide range of different people and different partners that we have worked with, we work with over the future. Um, and say, for example, I was saying some of them um, are quite big organisations like Natural England. So with, there's somebody we know who sometimes uses co-working spaces. Um, so we, we would we would probably um, we give everyone three three months trial and then we negotiate. Um, you know, if they can afford to pay us a price, cards, that's fine. So someone like Ardwick Current Action. We are a group of very local people in the next sort of couple of spaces, boroughs over, over there at the back of the university. And we, and they're very much a grassroots organisation that we as a museum are, are supporting. And it's a very long term relationship because Ardwick um, has a very complex relationship with the university. They've had, they've been researched on a lot. Also, if you go to the that road, which I can't remember the name of, and you go to the where Ardwick is and you look onto the university, it looks horrible. Like it's like <laughs> they've got these really horrible buildings and sort of thing. So um, we've taken the approach that we're we're gonna work with them in the long in for the long term. So it's not a sort of thing. But also we've said, well, how would you like us to help you? So we've been helping them in terms of going to plant bulbs on a mass bulb plant, say. We've been going to their meetings. And this Wednesday, if you want to come and see some of this work in action, they are doing a takeover of the top floor between 5.30 and 8. You can come and find out what sort of action that they're doing and meet speakers like um, Esme, who's our director, and Vernon maybe might be coming. Um, 
Jenna um, might, Ashton might yeah. come. Anyway, so there'll be some things. Oh, we're talking next Wednesday. Yeah. Next Wednesday. Yeah. Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. Evening, 5.30 to 8. And I can anybody say, can come Anyone along. can come, it's free, so you can see how it's yeah. sort of a different way of working. So I have probably spoken long enough. I will let you um, have a look around. Um, the, there's another group. Uh, who are using the lounge space. But if you have any questions, um, do ask me now, or as we're walking around, or Susan will be able to put us in contact. Why you have a project with these artefacts um, and people kind of overlaying their own understandings. Oh, the... because that's the basis of everything we're trying to do at the moment, that... Um, uh, I mean, to have and to heal comes under our arts and health work. Um, so we feel that, and we sort of strongly believe there's a real power in objects. So helping, so that would be an example of where objects are being used to help people talk or to share their feelings. But we're heavily involved in questioning the knowledge that we have in the museum because we're the result of a... a colonial institution, a colonial education system, you know, thinking that the Western way of thinking is the only way of thinking. So we're, that's also part of that process as well, to sort of um, decolonise ourselves. Um, but for, for years, when, ever since I've worked here, we've always realised that everyone has a relationship with, with, with objects and that can be in many different ways. Sort of thing. Yeah, that, that makes help? a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Lovely to meet you all. And if you have any other questions about anything I've said, <laughs> just ask Susan. And we're happy to share. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll hand you over to Rachel. Hello. Who talk about living worlds. Indeed, yeah. we will. Have a lovely weekend. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Anna. Thank you. That was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. So, hi everyone. My name's Rachel. I'm the curator of botany here at the museum. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a bit about our Living Worlds Gallery, and then after that, free to go. Uh, so this was opened in 2011, so slightly before I started here. I wasn't part of the team who developed this one. Um, I came along for the Nature's Library that's above, but this sort of work as a pair in that sense. Um, so pre previous to what was in here now, um, the gallery had a very sort of traditional outlay of... Um, animals and birds and a sort of taxonomic order to help, um, a bit like a textbook, to help people understand the relationships between animals and how they've evolved. Um, and it wasn't really being used in the way that it had been envisaged, you know, back in 1915 or whenever that was decided on this, the concept for here. Um, and so they wanted to change and want to have something that was quite considerably different for the museum at the time. And so one of those things was to start to try and bring together two things that have been quite separate in the museum. So that was the natural history collections and the cultural collections, and to sort of uh, acknowledge that those aren't separate things and to try and put people at the heart of a, a natural history gallery so that it's not focusing on animals and their relationships, but on human beings and our relationship to the natural world. So they worked with um, a designer, not a museum designer, but a, a kind of designer for fashion shows, Villa Eugenie, uh, to create something that was a bit more of an experience and something more of a kind of art installation feel to it than the traditional museum feel. Um, so we have these uh, neons with words on, and these were themes which came out of the workshops to develop the content, which reflected ways in which you might find yourself connecting to the natural world. So things that you love, things that you are scared of, things that might happen to you or that you go out and search for that experience. Um, so uh, that became the way that these kind of cases were themed to, to hold different material. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of cases. I'm going to start with one that was original to the gallery from its outset and then some of the ones that we've changed recently and just tweaked um, for our reopening. So we'll head that way. <laughs> So this was um, twofold, really. One is to acknowledge the way that 
a lot of the material has ended up in historic collections such as ours, and that is as hunting trophies from people who've gone out from the UK to hunt particularly large game or anything with spectacular antlers in other parts of the world and to bring them back to the UK. Um, so we wanted to uh, sort of highlight that to the visitor and to get, get people kind of considering how our views and values have changed over time from the position when this was quite an acceptable pastime to the current day when this really isn't seen as acceptable by the large amount of people um, and, and, and how that's kind of changed to our more sort of conservation-focused views that, um, that tend to um, hold sway today. Um, and the other is to think about that sort of traditional viewpoint that we as humans have domination over all of the natural world, that it's ours as a resource to, to do what we like with. And so to, to get people to reflect on that kind of uh, that kind of viewpoint that's been entrenched, in, particularly in British society, for a really long time, um, have something to, to work with and, and away from, I guess. Um, so the idea was for the gallery to be really quite light touch in its interpretation. So we have these panels at the end, which sometimes give a, a quote from someone that gives you an idea of the context of the assemblage of objects. Um, sometimes it's a little descriptive um, paragraph and then uh, a sort of little code with what the different objects are. And you'll notice when you go around and have a look that you we also have, although predominantly it's natural history and much like this was animals and birds upstairs there's still a lot of zoology there are a lot more uh, kind of cultural objects that have come in as well so in the symbols case for instance you'll find archaeological coins so there's stuff that's that's sort of demonstrating how the these um uh the kind of two worlds of the museum of nature and culture aren't, aren't really separate entities um and so this really light touch interpretation also allows us over time we've had some kind of changing pop-up things in here like uh when we had a an exhibition called climate control about climate change in about oh, was that 2016 maybe 2015 um in here there was a, a, a sort of set up on 10 ways to make a difference so it was encouraging people to think about the, the sort of things that we all do and whether we can make different choices so it's sort of linked into the themes of the gallery and then had something slightly more overt in its messaging to link to the temporary exhibition. Right, I'm now going to go to that case. Oh, that, fine. This is largely as it was uh, when we first opened, but it's been tweaked. For, so the museum was shut and we reopened in February this year and so this had a, a sort of facelift. So largely it's the same content, it's largely the same message, but we've slightly changed the interpretation and, and how we're presenting that message to the public. So when it opened, it said weather instead of climate, because at the time when they were working on this in 2009 to in 2010, they felt that perhaps climate wasn't a common enough word for people to really understand and distinguish the difference between climate and weather. And that's been an annoyance to the staff ever since, because obviously... As time goes by, we feel that people really do have a good concept about what climate means. Uh, so the first thing we did was to change the title on the top of the case. Um, there was also something of a heat map, a sort of blurry picture of the world behind. Um, and so my colleague Hannah Hartley, our um, environmental sustainability manager, we had a discussion. We thought, let's put this in because the, the climate stripes are becoming something that people encounter very much more frequently and it gives you that sort of sense of a changing climate as a backdrop to the animals that are in here without having anything too fussy that you particularly have to be looking at to, to understand behind it. So we also took the opportunity then to double check the animals because when this case was put in there were a, it was you know this is predicted that there will be a change and this will be badly impacted by XYZ. So we took the opportunity to just uh, do a sort of fresh literature search, see if the things that we were saying about those animals were still the things that were considered about those animals or whether we needed to swap some out. So for instance, the crane is a new bird here. We had a different one and we felt this had a stronger story than the Plus it had been conserved and looked beautiful, so it was ready for display. Um, so we thought we'd change the, the object that was in there. 
So these are largely animals which are either migratory, say in the case of the crane, um, so changing climate patterns will mean that that might make it more difficult for it to move between various places where it, it uh, lives. And then others, for instance, are animals which hibernate or animals which live on mountains and therefore they're going to run out of the top of the mountain if they keep seeking colder locations as you go up. Um, so we, we, I'm, you know, me and Hannah, who worked on this, are quite, quite pleased on this as a, an outcome of quite a coherent story now of a, a reworking of one of the existing cases that was in here. Right, one more, and then I shall let you have a wander around yourself. I just have a very you quick can, question. Yeah. I, I love the background, and uh, I, I've seen all the NASA visuals that kind of um, link to this. Um, do people know that the background is it's written down there? Is it? I have not done any visitor surveying to find that out, to be honest. Um, it would be really interesting to know. Um, it's the kind of thing where I'd quite like to have students just sort of perch you and pounce on people, but I haven't done it yet. Uh, partly because we've just been so busy that, you know, it's not that. It's very difficult to do that kind of work when it's absolutely jam-packed in here. Um, so hopefully uh, people see it and take the message and, and find out. That would be interesting. I cannot prove it at the moment. Um, we have a student here. Maybe well, you never know. Exactly. <laughs> I throw these ideas out. That's not the option. Um, oh. So this case is completely empty. As <laughs> you just realised, I'm not going to talk about the one with the objects in them. Uh, I'm going to talk about the empty one. So we had, um, when this first opened, there was quite a sort of high concept uh, layout in here featuring replicas, real objects, other things. And I think I can count on one hand the number of people I've ever given a tour to in this gallery who understood the content of this case. And it was really difficult for, uh, for our learning team to use, for instance, and, and engage children around. Um, and so when the museum closed for half, half of it closed in the initial stage for redevelopment, this part was still open. We had to do some um, events for the Manchester Literature Festival and we needed somewhere to display an object with its related poem. So this case, it, it just had to be this case. It was easy to empty. It was the right size. We couldn't get the right case for the object through our various doors and everything. So we had in here the Benin Tusk and we had the poem um, that related to it. When we were re going to reopen, we were quite clear that we weren't going to have the Benin Tusk in. We were not going to reinstate the original case that nobody really understood. And so we were having a lot of discussion of ideas of what could we put in there? Because obviously the title life does not really narrow it down. And there's so many different directions in which you can take that. Um, so, you know, whether you were talking about sort of life on planet Earth and why we have life here and not in the rest of the solar system, for instance, or are you talking about life and the threats to life? But then that is picked up across the rest of the gallery, so maybe having a, uh, something specifically about it is a bit weird. So we decided to just leave it empty and to ask the public. And so um, we are... How many months have we been open? In February. Um, we are now, we've got thousands and thousands and thousands of responses from the public, some of which, if you flip through, there's a nice one in there of uh, someone dressed up as a hot dog. Um, but there is, you do get an awful lot of quite well thought through. People do spend the time sometimes and, and write out some really in-depth responses to it. Uh, quite often we get mirrors in there that they want to have people featured or yourself within the case. Um, so we've now got a bit of work to do to kind of look at what people have been saying, see what they've been identifying as gaps across the rest of the kind of content and to think about how we might do that. So personally I want to have something in here that really does reflect what people have been saying and possibly to have an element by which we can change that as well. So maybe to have some featured objects that we sort of change periodically uh, and, and reflect some of the things that people have been asking for, so people are saying there's not enough fish, where's the aquatic world in here for instance, that kind of thing. Um, so we will hopefully <laughs> be putting something in here 
in the future and that we wanted to relate to what our visitors have been asking for or commenting on. Uh, so if anyone would like to write what they feel should be in our case, please do. Um, and other than that, I think you get about 10 minutes to look around the gallery and then come back to me for a sort of discussion and any further questions. I, I think that would be such a lovely thing for us to do as a group. Just sit down and would, think about it yeah. and then people can come down and come back in their Absolutely. own time and write their I ideas know. down. I think yeah. that would be a lovely thing. I mean, I, I, I really get why you've left this empty. I think it's quite a powerful yes, it's a powerful time, space. And, it's not necessarily something you can do for the long term, you know. <laughs> well, Although some people do suggest that they will leave it empty. Yeah. So we've got ten minutes and then yeah. we'll come back. No, the goat and the blue jumper is still on display. This one had a, a shark's jaw and false teeth, and it had the hummingbird and the Christmas decorations. Yeah, I have Yes, I know. I spent so much time looking at it. The one person I met was a uh, professor in theology and philosophy who was like, oh, yes. Yes, this is saying some interesting things. I'm like, can you explain it to me? I'm not sure I'm fully getting it. So it's quite interesting. It's not the full audience, you know what I mean? No, no. It's not the general. It was missing most people. What were the thoughts that you offered that? So I think it was, I mean, I think the original idea was to kind of think about sort of. Because obviously a lot of the things in the museum we're talking about life, they were once living things, but all of them are dead apart from the frogs. Um, and then there's the, the age of which they are dead. So, you know, the fossils to the more recently uh, sort of taxidermies. Um, and so then there was the kind of juxtaposition about real objects from the museum and kind of replicas or toys as a sort of sense of... So life at various levels of having been dead for a while or not ever real and what the difference might be between, you know, when you've got an inanimate object. So I think that was one of the points. And then there was various things about the, the content, because um, like the jaws, I think it was, it was sort of making you think about or well, asking you to think about eating and about you know, things that were necessities of different kinds of life if you're a, a hummingbird and flying. Or, but it was so difficult to explain that, yeah. yeah. There, was a, there was a replica dodo egg surrounded by stuffed dodo toys. So the, the egg was a replica and the dodo toys are toys. So what's the difference? When you're showing what an extinct bird is, you know that kind of thing. So, yeah. <laughs> but there's no answer to that. So you know, yeah. it, uh, it's the, a kind of puzzle, puzzling question. Yeah. whizzing. Or exploding. At this point on a Friday afternoon, I would have no answers to it. That's what I'm <laughs> Oh, but yeah. I'm in flashbacks now. Yeah, I bet you are. <laughs> many, many hours of going, why, 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 why? I mean, one of the things about the um, uh, the hummingbirds in particular is it was a bit sad because the, the cr Christmas tree decoration hummingbirds were so glittery that you couldn't, it, you didn't see the real ones because there was all these sparkly Christmas oh, decorations. And then there was maybe a dozen real very delicate, beautiful, but not quite shouting as loud hummingbirds. And so, you know, I think you also lost something. Anyway, we'll see what happens next. Well, it's, I, I, I know that from talking with a number of artists, mm -hmm. you, you've got very mixed opinions. Some are like, no, no, I don't want to tell people what to think. I mean, people should arrive. arrive at those thoughts. Yes. And then there are other people who, who really sort of go, oh, yeah, you know, I'm here, here's a, you know, a whole exposition that I yeah. want people to read. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, this gallery was very much designed on the idea of the first principle. So presenting people with things and allowing them to kind of make the connections yeah. themselves and to come to conclusions. And I think... Particularly at that point in time, it, we were beginning to reach a stage where everyone had a phone in the pocket 
And so there was a sense from the museum about why would we put a textbook on the wall when you can just Google anything now and find that information. So it's our role to make you interested or curious and for then you to take that further and to find out more if that was something that spoke to you when you were looking around and looking at things. Interestingly, I think now things, I mean, in our newer galleries, people have wanted to put in more text and I think it's possibly moving back slightly is my, is my impression that it was very much at least in terms of the organizational ethos that it was like we you know stripped back and not having a textbook on the wall there will be l limited interpretation just to set people on the, the kind of theme and then develop that i think we're in a time now where there's over saturation information exactly. so people don't know what to trust they can google something what's that like but it could be, it could be anything yeah, yeah exactly so it does feel like it's sort of turning a page a bit and the museum's wanting to have whether it's the museum writing it or whether it's like a collaborator or a partner writing something that we want to be able to say here's an authored piece of information from us from this other person or individual and this is their view on on this situation here yeah. yeah so yeah it's interesting really Complex spaces, absolutely very complex. And so you will feel that there's a real difference as you go around the different sort of galleries. You can tell that sort of change in in tone, really, in in the way that things are interpreted. Yes. One, one sense of that, there's a part of me saying that the journal art is that could be written. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I've got at least uh, fifteen hundred. Thousands, I don't know, <laughs> thousands of comments. Yeah, um, comments. <laughs> you come up here, and this is the space in which you would have your fancy dinner. Yep. And so there would be tables laid out, white linen, waiter service. And at the same time, you've got skeletons on display, and you've got the, um, you know, the, the bodies from Pompeii, from the... the plaster casts and so on with the word disasters on the top and you're like I'm, there's some sort of dissonance here <laughs> while I'm sat here at this fancy event wearing my finery so yeah it was always a bit cute so now we, I think we still do use this space but also that main hall is oh, right. is also used extensively for that kind of cooking and that's a you know good for easier for starters but uh, yeah it gives that sort of room for dancing and slightly. And that way, that's the main thing now, the dancing area. That, that, that is one of the key places. So they, they can, they're still both bookable, I think, for mm. events and that kind of thing. But that one's a bit more flexible because it's not got the collections in the room. Because obviously, it just makes major restrictions on what you can do in here as well. You know, so. I, me I remember the weddings. I did a lot of weddings. But yeah, I, I always used to like giving the, the music, the wedding, the, 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 the wedding oh, Really? You I, was, were... I was the person who got asked to actually sit there and I'd wait for the bride to paint. And play the music. Play the, which... That's a hair-raising job. <laughs> it was. I remember, I remember a groom came to me with the music on an, an iPod. It's like a really old iPod. Old -fashioned. It was completely smashed to bits and um... had 2% charge in it. Oh. And it was like, and that was the only thing that had the song on, on it. On his wedding day. On his wedding think... day. Yeah. I had to try and find an old iPod charger. So I was running around the museum trying to find something that we didn't have. I, mean, I went to the IV, AV store. I actually emptied it out in 10 minutes. I was, it was, I had to clean it up afterwards when I had time. And, it, and I couldn't get the actual thing to it. That wasn't moving anyway. So I had to just hope for the best. And press play. Press no, play. It wasn't going to be Black Sabbath yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that was stressful. I, I had a time when the groom gave me the wrong music oh, and the bride wouldn't come. She just refused. She just refused <laughs> to walk in the door. <laughs> and then that was a debate. <laughs> that was a debate. Mm -hmm. uh, another time where I think the bride drain got ripped at one point and we had to fix it with like, we, we had to fix it with like um, standard dirty wet badges from the shop. We had to actually sew it back into it. So yeah, yeah. It was me and Kate who were the shop. Yeah, we were the only ones actually there. So we had to actually try to fix the bride's dress. Uh, oh, there, there was a moment. Things like, you do not expect when yeah. you just get done yeah. the museum. Yeah, mm -hmm. crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. So this gallery, uh, the, this building was built, um, the architects are the same as the Natural History Museum and Strangeways Prison. And so you can see, you know, in, in terms of those old films where you've, you've got someone walking around an old school prison and uh, you can see how it's designed to be, uh, have a superintendent walk around it or something just to keep an eye on what everyone's doing in the space. It also means that you can hear everybody on every floor. Um, anyway, so... 
Any thoughts, any questions? What have you seen or wondered about? I've, Go for it. I've been really impressed at how much of a living space this is. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I would be quite happy if you locked me in here <laughs> and, and, and let me roam uh, because, you know, it's, it, it's so varietous mm -hmm. it does interesting th things to my mind in the sense that unusual effects, other unusual thoughts are being stimulated. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts of the, the, the environment you're curating and uh, coordinating as a learning space. That's really lovely to hear, really. Um, I mean, partly I think there is the gift of the building because it is quite atmospheric in and of itself and the, the new bits have different feels to the older parts and so on and the juxtapositions of all of that. Um, in terms of the content we put in, um, you always have you always have a plan in mind of what you're hoping to suggest to anyone who's visiting, but you can never really know whether that is actually what your what the outcome is. And so we we try and be guided by our um, uh, building a sustainable world and understanding between cultures. And so that's the sort of underpinning thing that we're always trying to reflect back on. But beyond that, it you know it becomes a sort of we don't really know what anyone is bringing into the museum, and it's really that that then that interaction between the person and their previous experience and knowledge and their likes and dislikes, and then how that interacts with the display that you've put on as to how they what they take away from it really. Um, so we've got four and a half million objects in the museum, um, and we have to tiny, tiny proportion of it is ever on display at any one time. And some of it will never be on display because it, it just isn't worth looking at. So you've got this kind of, you might have some brilliant stories about things, but you can't really show them because the thing is nothing to look at unless you've got, you know, the right massive fancy microscope or whatever it is. Um, and then you might have something that looks beautiful, but you don't really know what to say about it. So you, you've also got that sort of balance of getting something that says enough, that looks good enough, that anyone's going to come and pay attention to it. Um, and I think in some ways, some of the, the things that we've had in here, we haven't thought enough about the juxtapositions between something and what it sits next to. Ah, we were thinking about that. Yeah, um, before. Oh, um, one of the things that we really liked was it feels almost serendipitous. Uh, yes. And, and there's something happens. lovely about that because then you can have the discussion that Kelsey and I and Ying and, uh, were having yeah. here. Why are these things here? And we don't get many there. chances <laughs> in society to, to bring things together in ways which are not... Um, immediately understandable. Mm. So, so I, I really like that about uh, about this, the kind of ser serendipitous nature of things and the ways in which you can um, you can it, it obliges you to think a little bit. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. It's, well, it's lovely it's to meet you. Been a wonderful all. trip. As yeah. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, as Anna said, and I'm sure everyone else did, just let us know if you have thoughts afterwards or you know, things that you want to find out about or seeing more. We'll always try and oblige as much as we can. Yes. Okay, yeah. We'll bring together our own cabinet of uh, interesting, <laughs> interesting bits and pieces. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's all right. Thank have you. a great weekend. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. As always, it was wonderful, you know. It's, it's, I learned something new every single time I come here. <laughs> well, you'll probably get a different one of us in each of the galleries every time, don't you? <laughs> yeah, and a slightly different take, which is yeah. really interesting. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, no all right, thank you.